Welcome to Lessons from the Playroom. In this podcast, Lisa Dion will help you explore the little things that make a big difference in play therapy. Lisa is a founder of Synergetic Play Therapy. You know, sometimes therapists get all caught up trying to study big theories and mastering techniques to help children like me. But sometimes it's the little things we show you along the way that make the biggest difference. Join Lisa as she teaches you some of the little lessons that children are trying to communicate to you so that you can help us in the best ways possible. And on behalf of all the kids you work with, thanks for listening and believing in us. Let's get started. Hi, listeners. Welcome back to the next episode from the Lessons from the Playroom podcast. And I have with me another really special play therapist in our field. Um, Marshall Lyles is a gem in our field right now. He is bringing, in my opinion, new thought, new life, new um, new excitement to different processes and things that we have heard about for years. So he's specifically going to be talking to us about sand tray and attachment and trauma, uh, but he has such a special way of integrating the three and talking about them. So if you're not familiar with my amazing guest, Marshall lives in Austin, Texas. He's been at this for 20 years-ish, over over 20 years. He teaches internationally on trauma using expressive therapies. He also um, does EMDR and you've done amazing stuff with combining EMDR and expressive therapies, um, mainly Santre, if that's my my understanding. Uh, You have um, published books, articles, and you have a new one that is out, which I know we're going to talk about and get into. And I had the absolute pleasure of spending time meeting Marshall three years ago. You were coming through Denver with our mutual friend, Robin Goebel, and the three of us met up and we got to say hi and share a meal together. And I've loved you ever since. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we have a, a kind of a shared signature of sincere sarcasm. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> we do. We do. Um, Marshall, anything else that you would love to share that I didn't mention as I was introducing you? Oh, just that the affection is mutual. I love so much, Lisa, what you've done for our community and um, the perspectives that you've brought in. And um, I know a lot of people in the field who have been really powerfully impacted um, by your teaching and your mentoring. And so I have a lot of gratitude for your work. Thanks, Marshall. Actually, one thing I do want the listeners to know about you, because it's a really special part of you, is that you also love poetry and you write poetry and it's beautiful and it's magical. And I'm actually going to ask if you're willing to share because you have some poetry that you have written even on the related to the topic of Santre and trauma and attachment. So if you could weave that in for us, that would be, that would be awesome. Absolutely. The poetry is the, 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 the natural prosody of speech that I think, uh, that, that we need for attachment healing. And so I, I'm, I'm on a mission to convert all therapists into a loving poetry. That's beautiful. Well, Marshall, let's just start with just um, attachment wounds and trauma and, and working with attachment wounds and trauma. You know, we have listeners from all over the world and everyone is at a different level of their understanding and training uh, in this field and in this profession. So let's just begin with a discussion on that and, and, then, and then how you use Santre to, to support the healing and, and integration of attachment wounds. Uh, I, I, you know, what's amazing to me is how long attachment theory has been around, but that there's some fresh energy that, that seems brand new in some way, you know, like there, there's a lot of discovery happening. So I, I love, I love that subject. 
Yes, that's one of the reasons why I love you because that's my perception of you is you're one of the individuals that's bringing the fresh and the new around around these topics. So bring us some fresh and new in this discussion, Marshall. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as it relates to play therapy in particular, I, and I think a, a lot of our play therapy models are, are getting to the point where they're now trying to describe how their concepts are consistent with you know, things from attachment theory. And I love that. I love that the that people are reaching for that. And at the same time, you know, attachment theory is far more complicated than it looks on the surface. And um, I, I think it's really worthy to go do some deep dive. Um, and, and at the same time, when we do deep dive into the academic part of it, a lot of personal activation comes up because it's not something that can remain <clears throat> distant we end up having to filter it all through. Um, and, and I think the best way to organize the search goes back to some of Bowlby's original um, architecture is to understand that he said um, at the, the most primitive level when we're receiving care um, uh, and, and the kind of security we need from the caregiving is holding that um, homeostasis, the relational balance between our secure base and our safe haven needs that we have these kind of programmed relational opposites deep inside all of us as humans at birth where we need someone who's capable of holding us really close and pulling us in in the tender moments, but also is completely comfortable in believing in our capacity to explore ourselves in the world. And this safe haven being the hold us close and the secure base being allowing us to explore. <clears throat> and from those two concepts, it just branches into all sorts of complexity and beauty and pain and resilience. Uh, and that, that, that's actually how I try to organize all, all of the ways that I think of play and sand. Mm -hmm. you're, you're highlighting something for me that feels really special, which is that, that really vulnerable place within the caregiver, or let's say in our case, us as clinicians in the moment when we're trying to support a healing of an attachment wound, that inevitably we're, we're forced into the mirror of our own relationship with ourselves, with our, our own attachment um, history and how vulnerable that, that, that place can be. You're, you're really just highlighting that, that it's, it's such a, it's not just what do we do to help another person heal their attachment wound, but in order to do that, what are we doing within ourselves mutually? Yeah. Yeah. Which I, I think because um, of the mirror um, and even Lowenfeld, you know, Margaret Lowenfeld, who was someone who really brought some organization into the exploration of Sandus therapy, she, she called the Santre a mirror. She yeah. said, it's like looking into, like meeting oneself in the mirror and coming into contact with the slice of reality of who we are. Uh, and and I, I think because of what you said, that we have a burden um, as therapists to be looking into those modalities as mirrors for ourselves and not waiting only until we're in session to engage. Uh, so, you know, the sand tray is a beautiful way to journal as a therapist. And, and I think that we ought to be looking into the mirror in, in some time for our own recovery and healing and not just when we're with uh, clients. For our clinicians that aren't that familiar with sand tray work, will you share just a little bit about how does one even, from your perspective, think about the tray or approach the tray or give us a little bit of a, from Marshall's perspective. It's, you know, it's beautifully sacred. Mm -hmm. So there, that there is an understanding that, that we're, we're trying to, bless this container um, as, as a holding space, as, as a boundary protected um, space for exploration and discovery. Um, and it's full of course of the ground and the sand. And, and so then we have that sensory element um, at play that, that's providing the base for the bottom up nature of the work that we do. And so before you ever get into worlds and, and miniatures or symbols or images or beings, you know, whatever language you use for that, uh, the materials, the base materials of just the, the container and the sand themselves 
I think, set the tone for um, the grounding. Bonnie Badnock says that a lot of our clients, especially those who have attachment wounds, are going to be more at ease coming into a relationship with our materials than they are us. And so, that you know, the materials then get to be an extension of who we are. It's part of where we meet each other. Um, and then out of, you know, a growing respect for those base materials, you build collections of miniature images that are diverse in nature and um, and representative of, of any of a number of things. And clients get to choose as many or as few figures as they need to create what we call worlds in the sand uh, that we then hold in metaphor. Uh, we respect the metaphor. We explore with that externalization and distance and practice making meaning. And I think a good course of sand tray therapy treatment involves not a client having walked away from a session with someone having made meaning for them, but they have an increased capacity to make meaning for themselves. And that, that's the beauty. That's, that's where you really watch that reflective functioning development from an attachment point of view start to, to flourish. I don't think we, we should be focused just on solving a problem. You know, it's what are the mechanisms and infrastructure that this person deserves to know they have access to so that they can address both this problem and many future ones that will be related. Mm -hmm. How do you see children using the tray to explore their attachment wounds? Like what are, what, what are some of the ways they approach it? What are some of the common things that we, that we see? Yeah, uh, you get so much attachment information a lot of times just from watching their fingers touch the sand. You know, like the ones who are all in and like it's no longer just hands, but now we're up to our elbows and the whole body's in. <laughs> their heads <laughs> in, yeah. <laughs> I've had kids that have tried to actually climb into it and then pour it on top of them. Yeah. Absolutely. And there's there's something so life-giving like that information is so helpful from a you know sensory seeking point of view that we get to hold but then you also see the other kids who the minute they touch it their like fingers arch back away from their hands and then they even after the sand is off their fingers they continue to rub it, rub it off their hands for minutes to come uh, so th there's something just from a sensory level that we get information that's not always about attachment woundedness, but is often, you know, connected. And, and it, at the very least, it lets us know some deep nervous system needs that they have and what co-regulation is going to look like before worlds are ever built. You know, you have right off the bat this wonderful communication of what their body needs us to know. Um, but then, then after that, developmentally, you start to see such a range of how kids will um, let you know what you need to know about their woundedness. Um, uh, some, some based on age or based on need or, or maybe even attachment stream, they, they continue to, they, they create a world and then it's in continue mo continued motion. Like it's just a dynamic ever evolving story that never gets to a conclusion. And that feels a lot of times more like traditional play therapy where you end up reflecting and tracking and holding and amplifying. But then you have some who are at a different developmental place and they get to a static place and that creation time is a little quieter. And so you're getting the information from the quiet about what they're putting into the world. You know, that attunement gets so thick in those quiet moments of creating. Uh, and then in the narrative, in the way that they reveal the narrative to you, you get a sense of where's their coherence? Where do they lose coherence? Where does the pace change in re relationship to what theme is being uh, revealed? And just data upon data of important things, even though we don't always know what it means as therapists, it's, it's clues that they're they're leaving at your feet and just begging for you to understand about their system so so beautiful as we're we're talking here i'm i'm reminded that sometimes there is i think an assumption that play therapists make that the sand like feels good right and it's fun to play in the sand tray and 
sometimes that's true. And sometimes that's, that's not true. And I'm, I'm hearing this invitation also to not make assumptions about what it is like for the child or where the child needs to go or what the meaning is or how it even feels on their hands or what, or whatever, because it's use the word sacred, right? It's their, it's their experience, which may be totally different than our experience of it. Will you speak yeah. a little more about that? Cause I think sometimes there are a lot of assumptions that are made about, about the tray and, and what shows up in the tray. Oh yeah. I, I think we even have so many assumptions about our rooms, you know, that like if, and I know not everyone can see me, that, but you see behind me, I have, you know, very full shelves and an all open shelf display. Um, and, and part of the theory is for many people that communicates welcome and choice. Uh, that is overwhelming for a large percentage of the people. And, and, and so there, there are assumptions I think we have made all along the way in setup and enjoyment and ease that are not equally true. I'm really grateful for the, the literature that's coming out on neurodivergence mm -hmm. and helping to widen understanding mm -hmm. that there are lots of legitimate needs and they're not all things for us to fix. You know, that sometimes this is, some of the most beautiful parts of how someone's wired and it's to be respected. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's not something we're meant to try and change. Mm -hmm. And those assumptions usually lead us into agendas and there's just no room for agendas in therapy. Mm -hmm. Marshall, will you take us into the, the place where we started in the conversation about the therapist's own, own journey? And you know, as we are facilitating someone's process or as we are thinking about doing more sanitary work our, our, like our own our own journey and how do we navigate our own inner landscape as we're being activated with our own experience of the sand or as we're observing a child's experience of the sand can we go can we go into that part of this oh yeah <laughs> that, that gives me feelings <laughs> <laughs> it's it's Hardest part. <laughs> it is. And you know, I, I go back in time, Lisa, and I think at the beginning of grad school, if you would have told me that one day an eight year old would pick a toy off a shelf and put it in the sand tray and that it would immediately create some dysregulation in me, I would have called you a liar to your face mm -hmm. because it that just sounded so absurd to think about. But it it's just there's there's such energy in the room when the client starts moving towards choices and, and moving towards parts of themselves is especially when they're going to the shelves to choose things. And that really is asking us to be a secure base. And then I am trying to stay attuned and my brain, my mirror neurons forget sometimes that what I'm taking in from them is them. You know, sometimes it thinks it's me and sometimes it touches things that were true about me. And, and there are little clues that we have to develop of when we're substituting our own story mm -hmm. um, for, for the one that's trying to be shared mm -hmm. with us, like um, beginning to notice in the moment if um, you're thinking they're doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, if that thought happens, then that's probably because you had a story based in your own lived experience that you were watching play out. And then when it didn't go how you thought, it was, you know, upsetting to your narrative. Mm -hmm. um, or uh, if you start to experience um, a, like a confusion, like a wash of confusion coming over you, I think that's when a lot of times we've moved into our own story and we've dropped the the, the story that our clients are asking us to hold. Mm -hmm. and so we've got to, we both got to have, um, this is something Robin and I used to teach about together um, in a workshop we did. Um, we both have to have the abilities and sanitary and all kinds of expressive play to notice in the moment when things are happening and to notice out of the room when those things are happening related to certain people in our lives. And they're different skills. Um, they're, they're, they're different parts of our nervous system. So it's part of why I believe as much as possible, if you can carve out time to create your own worlds in the sand as a therapist, you're reducing the risk 
of, of those uh, miniatures um, accidentally bringing part of your story into the room with a client that's out of your awareness, you know, that we've kind of fallen into relationship with all of our materials in a way that we can differentiate when this is me versus not. In fact, uh, in the book that uh, Dr. Homeyer and I uh, wrote, um, she encouraged me, she knew that I'd gone through a journey some years ago of making, um, I decided to make very public. It's, it, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm introverted, right? So I don't live a lot out loud. I have to work really hard to, to put myself out there. And I, I was feeling like we need maybe as therapists to be seeing each other do our own trays. So I did many days in a row of sharing trays I was making and, and, and writing, kind of making my journaling public. And she asked if I would put some of those in the book because we have a chapter specifically on the person of the sanitary therapist and what practices are you developing to monitor your own person. And it was really scary to include that in the book, um, knowing that once it happens, it's out there. Um, but that vulnerability, I, I, I think, was important for me, and and I hope um, you know others will will understand that that it's it's not an option. You know, we we don't get to do this job and be invulnerable. Right. Uh, those just aren't compatible. Right. Exactly. The the days of the blank slate, or check yourself at the door. It's uh, not 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 quite like that. No, I mean, I, I really wish that was true about our brains. I would, I, I would probably in a vote try to make it happen. <laughs> it's just, it's just not real. <laughs> Where would you get all your material for your poetry, Marshall? <laughs> <laughs> I'd just write about trees. Yeah. <laughs> it would be funny. <laughs> Marshall, you just referenced your your beautiful book with um, Dr. Linda Homeyer. Will you tell us a little bit about about your book? Yeah, you know, Dr. Homeyer and Dr. Sweeney had written together a, a book that's um, going going into a fourth edition now um, on uh, sanitary therapy basics. And um, she and I had been doing some teaching together for the past many years, and. Um, and, and came up with this idea of having an advanced kind of follow-up to that book that specifically was going to be um, going deeper with some of the, the, the um, certain basic aspects of Santry, um, and then specifically looking through an attachment and trauma lens. Um, so there is um, some material in there on neurodivergence and um, getting to talk to people who are experts at, you know, working with... Um, those on the autism spectrum and how that shows up in Santre, those who are gifted, how that shows up in Santre, um, then talking a lot more about understanding how the history of traumatology and trauma theory and attachment theory um, were developing around the same time that the Santre therapy was and starting to look at some of the natural overlaps uh, as well as, um, you know, what are some of the thought leaders in our field saying that goes a, a step deeper, you know, and so that we don't just keep in our field um, reproducing the same basic skills because it starts to sound like there's not much to expressive play therapy. You know, it, it starts to really sound really just, it's all foundational and it's not, you know, you, especially I think the clients that you and I would share in common, it's, they deserve for us to be nuanced. You know, they, they've earned the right for this to be far more complicated um, than it often looks on paper. And so we wanted to take a crack at that. So beautiful. Um, I want to make sure that I have the, the name um, correctly, but it's, it's, just, it's advanced sand tray therapy. Isn't that the name of the, of the book? Yeah. yeah. Then the subtitle that I'm going to read because I always forget <laughs> is uh, digging deeper into clinical practice. Okay. Beautiful. So listeners, um, this, if you are a Santre practitioner, um, even if you're not and you want to get more, more curious, uh, please go, please go check the book out. I know that it's uh, available now um, for you to, to, to order. Uh, 
Marshall, this just this conversation is so um, beautiful for me, even just where you just ended with just this idea of we have to keep stretching ourselves and we have to keep being willing to go into deeper nuances of our understanding of our clinical work. But even as I say that, what I love and what I know that you teach is that right next to that is the parallel of as you go deeper into the work with the child, you also have to go deeper into the work with yourself. And they go hand in hand. You can't separate out one, uh, one, from, one from the other. Um, what, a, what a big ask that we as play therapists have been handed. I mean, ultimately it's, are you willing to transform yourself so you can be of service to a child? Oh, yeah, yeah it, it, every job description for a therapist should say something like, um, are you willing to cry multiple times a week? You know, <laughs> are, are, are you comfortable being on the edge of a breakdown without actually having a breakdown? The, the, it, is, it is really um, difficult to describe to, you know, aspiring therapists the the aspect of our our work that requires us to cultivate um a, a constant reflective practice it, it i had i had no understanding of what that meant or was going to look like mm -hmm. um and and it was it was uh not easy um the, to step into the, in fact, I remember in grad school, even being about halfway through in a class where we were doing, you know, a million genograms and me thinking, I want to tap out. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to talk about this anymore. Yeah. And, I, 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 and, and, and especially the way that it was starting to show up for me is I was being challenged to have compassion for, for people in my life that I didn't think had earned the right to have compassion. Um, and then I started realizing kind of the dismissive nature of that. And there were always gonna be people trusting me with their care that were gonna remind me of traits mm -hmm. of these people I was trying to withhold, yeah. uh, you know, acceptance from, and and that my mind wasn't gonna automatically know the difference between them and others. Mm -hmm. So I had to find a way to be comfortable uh, extending peace to all the parts of me uh, and I, I, I just, I didn't understand Lisa that that's what I was signing on for. You know, Marshall, when I um, first got out of graduate school, well, actually, while well, I was still in graduate school in my internship, and I was asked to to work with a child, I had a freak out. Right, there was a part of me that was like, I do not want to work with kids, which is so funny for me to say now with what you know with what I do, but I was terrified of working with children, and I. I very quickly realized that it was because I intuitively knew that I was going to allow the mirror to be revealed through a child, that there was something so, um, I'm using the word innocent or clear about the mirror in a small form of a five-year-old or a seven-year-old or 10-year-old, that there was going to be a part of me that was going to be willing to let them in. And so it, it wasn't, it wasn't that I was actually afraid to work with children. I was so afraid for me to look at my self. I was so afraid to look at the parts of me that attracted me to being one of being wanting to be a therapist in the first place. Let's name that for all of us, right? There's a reason why we want to be therapists. We're bringing our own stuff into this and inevitably we, um, we meet up with it in the, in, in the playroom. Inevitably. You named that really, really beautifully. <laughs> you know, that I I didn't realize I I you know I I was born with muscular dystrophy and so I've had I've had this illness my whole life. And um it's not it wasn't something I spent a lot of time thinking about um, until I started working with kids and that mirror starts coming in and they they ask their very innocent questions about leg braces or about cane or about your surgical scars or or what have you. And in those early days of it is I started having to realize how self-conscious I really held myself in space. And even if I'm real honest, it opened the door to me realizing 
you know, some of the marginalization that was a part of my story that I just didn't identify with. Um, and and they, they were really poking at, at that, which was um, a big part of some years ago when I started doing the journaling is I spent probably a solid month just making um, sand trays about my, my body, about my physical body, because it was, I was becoming very aware that that was my biggest hindrance and my biggest opportunity to connection with people is I know pain. And if I can be at peace with the thing that causes pain, then people are going to find peace in me. Um, and that, that came from kids, I think. You've referenced your Santry work as a journal now a couple of times in this conversation. So um, can we invite the listeners actually into a practice of that? And do you have suggestions on what that, what that can look like? I mean, I've ever heard you say, take the time, but are there other tips or things that you could offer our, our listeners if they really wanted to okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really look at what would it mean to embody Santre as a way of journaling? Like, what, what does it look like? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, there, there are several things that come to mind. One is just putting it on your calendar, you know, like saying, instead of scheduling this hour, I'm going to leave it open for me. Um, and I don't think there's a right time of day, you know, I'm a morning person. So I, um, I need like a 6 a.m. slot. Uh, that's when I'm most alive and, and most thoughtful. Um, but some of my colleagues would say they can't open something up and then have a work day. So they need it, you know, in the evening. So I think part of it's just knowing you, but setting aside the time, um, having no agenda, having no preconceived notion, just kind of whatever is in you, whatever's on your mind, that, that is what prompts you towards beginning um, and then take your time with every single step, including sitting with the empty tray, you know, just seeing the emptiness, feeling the sand to the degree that you're comfortable, um, building slowly, then checking for completion, you know, thoughtfully looking at it, um, dialoguing with yourself. If you're a journaler, um, write at, you know, um, from it. And if, if you're not, then, Ask the pieces to have a dialogue, you know, voice them. Um, some people are more somatic. And so they might find a yoga sequence in their world that they build, you know, by finding the posture of certain figures that they need to hold and recreate to make contact. Um, others uh, will art, you know, create art out of it. You know, it will then inspire some painting or drawing and uh, in the poetry world, that's called nesting. You know, you write a poem and then you pull, you keep going back to it and pulling phrases uh, and you rearrange words and you find all the new combinations of what that original poem had to say. Mm -hmm. I think a santry entry is going to be the same mm -hmm. um, and based on all the other things. My, my primary personal um, art form that I use outside of writing is clay. And um, so I would often take something that had come up in class, I mean, in a tray, and I would take it to my one-on-one -on -one class with my clay teacher, and I would tell her about it. Mm -hmm. and, and so it wasn't just in therapy or in consultation. It was then I would say, I need, my hands need to do something with this. I just know I'm needing, I'm needing a bigger container than a pinch pot can hold, or, you know, I'm needing this for my world. And, and then she would help me construct something that would then go back to my original world oh, and oh. So I, whatever is your rhythm um if you can find a group of like-minded clinicians and you can do worlds and then come together i'm kind of a person of the therapist consultation group um i've been a part of a few of those and i'm um, doing one now virtually um that, that's really fulfilling for me um so yeah whatever Whatever you can find, whatever rhythm you can get into, um, it would work. That's so awesome. Marshall, I'm curious, as we are making our way towards our, our closure in this discussion, would you be open to sharing a little bit of the, the poetry that you that you wrote in the advanced um, Santre book just to kind of help bring this conversation together? Yeah, um, Dr. Homeyer was really kind to indulge 
and uh, I wrote a, a poem uh, that is a complete piece um, on its own, but then each stanza became the introduction to a chapter. Um, and so and I'd be happy to read, read that for you. It's called Digging Deeper. There is room for you here, room for your joys, your fears, room for your victories and your doubts. This is your world for the making. Each world deserves witness, every story worth hearing. The pages we turn together reveal this very moment began long ago. Connecting to sand and water, balance arrives, allowing images to show the way to possibility. Questions join as guide, but not needing answer. Direction does not depend on perfect knowing. Your guide is true, not because of a life pain-free, but because woundedness made way for compassionate curiosity. Seeds of difference sowed brought a harvest of strife. So we return to ground and water to remember sweet sensitivity's gift. In the stillness, we hear whispers of relationships past and you find freedom to choose if there is room for them in this world. Reclaiming power over world where terror once landed, but we reimagine stories art, even when words arrive on delay. In this world you create, fueled by mystery and light, you find your inner witness that delights as you bravely dig deeper. Got some tears, Marshall. You can just feel the the reclaiming of the of the self as you are um, as you read that. That's just what I heard. The it's so beautiful. I can almost hear the hear the attachment healing through the through the poem. You know, I think that's my my biggest hope, and it goes back to an original attachment term, but when we trust ourselves to show up in the world we create, our internal working model gets revealed to us. And, but only in the amount that we can tolerate seeing, like when, when Santre is held in a co-regulated um, metaphor respecting way, we get to come back to making deeper and deeper insight connections into how we were formed, you know, and all the things that we were taught were true that came from these early relationships get to be reevaluated. And our identity is no longer automatically decided by what was most primitively implicitly placed in us, that we have all this new data and that we find that in these worlds that we have power over. Mm. Magical. Marshall, this has been an extraordinary conversation. Um, Thank you for doing what you're doing out in the world and for reminding therapists to come back to themselves, to look a little deeper, dig a little deeper as you were, as you were just saying. Yeah. It's my pleasure. And thank you for having me and thanks for so doing grateful. this. So grateful. Listeners, um, please go check out Marshall's uh, new book. Please check Marshall Marshall out. You can go to his um, website. Marshall, what is the website they could go? It's it's my name smushed together, MarshallLyons.com. Beautiful. Um, if he is in your area live someday um, or uh, virtually, his his workshops are are really profound and amazing. I encourage you to to spend some time um, with with him. Thank you again, uh, Marshall. I can't wait until our paths cross again. And, uh, and yes, we can have another meal and, and share some more sarcasm together. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> awesome. And uh, everyone, uh, wherever you are in the world, remember to um, take some breaths, take care of yourself. Uh, remember that you are the most important toy in that playroom. For more information on our 
courses and our classes, please go to our website at synergeticplaytherapy.com and check out what we have available to you. And as always, remember that you're the most important toy in that playroom.